All right, if you find your seats, we'll get started. So uh, this is a joint seminar between the Institute for Energy Efficiency and the IEEE Photonics Society student chapter. And I want to highlight them. There's, there's a bunch of members here, but Eric Stanton is the president. Who are the other officers that are here? Um, but they just won Chapter of the Year Award, so uh, for all the United States as the, the best IEEE Photonics Society chapter. So uh, congratulations, guys. So, so uh, indeed, we're very happy to have Phil Lubin here from Department of Physics. He's been doing infrared uh, work forever and well known on campus for that. I was really surprised, though, reading his, his biography. I mean, it's really stellar work that, uh, you know, he won the... 2006 Gruber Prize in Cosmology. Um, he's co-PI in the Planck Cosmology, 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 see I can't even pronounce it, mission, much less know what it is. Um, and uh, he's been part of two dozen ground-based and balloon-borne missions uh, and two major cosmology satellites. So I mean, just really a well-known in this field and tremendous accomplishments. And so it's not surprising that this major initiative has, has happened. So I think we're all very excited to hear about it. So without further ado, Phil Lubin. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, one thing I, I want to uh, uh, talk about in the beginning is I want to show you a little video clip. And the reason is that with the talk I'm going to give is, is not so much to do with today, but it has to do with where we're going in the future, or where we could go in the future. And that's very important and, and probably quite different from many talks, certainly very different from, from things I do day to day, which are very focused on the here and now. You know, you've got to get this proposal the next week, blah, blah. I'm sure you're all used to that. Um, but this actually is looking ahead into the future and what could come. And therefore, I'd like you to just watch a short clip Ignore the messenger, but listen to the message, and particularly the student that, that speaks about their own excitement with this. Why do people explore? You know, that's a really profoundly interesting question. We've looked at the sky for as long as we've been alive. We dream in stories and in movies of traveling to the stars. Why? Thank you. 
So that, that movie was made on November 7th of last year, and the reason I mentioned that date and the reason I showed that was I didn't really want you to look at me, but I wanted you to see this young man in the movie. He's 18 years old. He started when he Luke was... Skywalker meets the princess. No, <laughs> okay. We're out of here. Sorry about that. Yeah. Could have been worse. <laughs> It could have been worse. <laughs> a lot worse. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, anyway, the young man in there was uh, 18 at the time. He started working this when he was 17 in high school. And uh, I will not live to see this project to fruition, but uh, he could. And therefore, it's important to look ahead to the next generation will actually accomplish this. That's November 7th, and I'll tell you the story of what happens a month after that, and then a month after that which is uh, very uh, different for me in terms of funding profiles, as, as you'll see shortly. Okay, so this is all about uh, could we use uh, photonics, in particular directed energy, uh, to get to the stars. Is it feasible to do that? You certainly see things much more dramatic in movies. The question is could we realistically do that given a time scale of perhaps a few decades? Uh, 30 years is, is a minimum, I think, in, in this realistic and it may be more like uh, 40 or 50 years. But I'll show you the technological basis for this and why it's not just a pipe dream, um, but in fact, uh, we believe it's doable. So the fastest things we currently have out in the space are uh, things like the Voyager spacecraft, which is currently traveling at about uh, 17 kilometers per second um, after uh, 38 plus years uh, traveling through the solar system. But on the scale, which is logarithmic here, which you cannot see at all, but there's factors of 10 every, every clip down at the bottom, uh, once we get out of our local, local neighborhood, we have a long ways to go, about 300,000 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun until we get to the nearest star um, beyond our Sun, which happens to be the Alpha Centauri um, stellar system. But there's a lot of other systems. That's just one of them. So, the question is, can we, we have any hope of doing this? Uh, this is a terrible first slide, I apologize. Um, all I would like to do is uh, perhaps go to the website later. Just uh, if you forget everything, which you probably will, just remember, uh, maybe just remember my name, but maybe Google something, Interstellar, UCSB, you know, we'll pull it up. There's a lot of papers on our website. There's probably 25 papers now. There's one major paper um, that's relevant to this which is this one, laser pointer for, since this is another directed energy system that's useful. Um, uh, this is a almost 70-page paper that talks about the technology and the, uh, the roadmap for this future. NASA put out a video in, I think it was February, uh, that it got a lot of hits. It actually, I think it's one of the uh, highest viewed NASA videos ever. <clears throat> uh, to date, it's uh, getting close to 2 million views, which really stunned me. I had no idea um, that this would happen. Um, on April 12th, which is uh, last Tuesday, uh, so eight days ago, uh, the Breakthrough Foundation announced that they, would, they pledged $100 million to support this effort, um, which is just stunning to me, frankly. Um, and I'll tell you the story of that, because it's, it's not like any 
other effort I've ever been involved in. Um, and that's to support the research and development phase only. The implementation phase actually is going to be um, orders of magnitude above that. And they've said that they, are, they have ways to do that, uh, which it's a different world out there when you uh, contact people that have a lot of money and a lot of uh, vision, not just money, but vision. Um, and I think a, a good thing to keep in mind, because people keep asking us, you know, there's all these problems, how are we ever going to solve them? And there's this great quote by the president of uh, IBM, uh, for those of you that forget that IBM used to make computers, uh, they did a long time ago, um, but it's probably because of this statement and many subsequent ones that they no longer are quite in the business they used to be. Uh, but, you know, the statement is, I think there's a world market for about five computers in the 1940s. Okay, well, it turns out that that was not quite right, um, and they were off by a, a little bit. Um, but one thing that's relevant in addition to predicting the future uh, not correctly is that the cost of things has come down dramatically. So the cost of a gigabyte of memory in 1955 uh, was about a trillion dollars. And a trillion dollars in 1955 was a lot of money. Um, whereas the cost of a gigabyte uh, today is about uh, a dollar. And in addition, it's roughly 10 million times faster. So things have evolved dramatically in some areas. On the other hand, the cost of freeway construction, <laughs> the cost of concrete has not evolved. And some things scale well, and some things don't scale well. So we'll have to talk about that. So here's some things that do not work. Uh, uh, the chemical propellants will not get us to the stars any time that's reasonable. Iron engines, which you probably hear about, will not get you there. Solar sails will not get you there. Uh, nuclear thermal engines will not get you there. Uh, fusion engines have a possibility of getting you there, uh, but actually quite a bit slower than we're talking about and m much more massive and much more expensive. And imaginary propulsion systems like warp drives, wormholes, and other things um, could get you there if you imagine, but uh, they're not on the real axis currently. Things like antimatter, you know, are a possibility. We do know how to produce antimatter. We just don't know how to produce it in the relevant quantities, nor how to store it properly, um, nor how to uh, really combust it, I would say, properly in a way that's efficient. So there's a Miranda Act in science which says anything you can say will be used against you. And unfortunately, in this case, uh, this was a article that came out in February based on the NASA release of the video, which is long before the Breakthrough Foundation uh, ever uh, got involved. Um, and we were quoted as saying we can fly to Mars in just 30 minutes. Um, well, yes, if you're willing to fly on a wafer and not be human um, and not stop at Mars, uh, yes. But unfortunately, that got blown out of proportion. This one, on the other hand, is not blown out of proportion, which is the use of lasers for a planetary defense, um, which we have many papers on, and we'll talk about that later. There are lots of papers to read. If you're interested, um, look at our website. There's things such as using active illumination for finding asteroids. Um, this roadmap to interstellar flight is actually uh, in press now. It will be 2016 because it got delayed. There's an interesting paper on implications of directed energy for uh, SETI, for searching for other civilizations that might be like our own. And the bottom line there that I'll show you is you can see across the entire universe with technology that we have today. And that's quite profound. Uh, lots of papers here. If you're interested, just go to the website. You can knock yourself out with more than 1,000 pages of stuff to read. Um, so Star Trek, which we all, um, well, I think many of us love, or similar variants of it, it's great for entertainment, but it doesn't really get you where you want to go. So if you want to really get somewhere, you have to think about how you're going to get there. And I'll, I'll talk about, at the end, hu sending humans uh, really doesn't make sense for many reasons, in my mind, for interstellar flight. Interplanetary, yes, but interstellar, it's uh, highly problematic. We're not really, I don't think we're designed for that kind of voyage. If you want to get to, a, to the stars in a lifetime, a human lifetime, you're going to have to have greater than 5% the speed of light, which would be about 88 years at 5% the speed of light to the nearest star. So that's the challenge that you're faced with. Well, we know how to get to very high speeds within a meter per second of the speed of light in the laboratory using particle accelerators. We just don't know how to 
scale that to accelerate something macroscopically. So we'll talk about how you do that, which is you basically don't take any propellant with you. You leave your propulsion system at home. And the reason you can consider doing that is because there are photonic advances, namely the ability to efficiently convert electrical energy into photonic energy and be able to produce large phased arrays oops, that make this possible. No, I did something bad. Pardon? Projector went off. Okay, sorry, that was me. Okay, so directed energy, as we'll see, is a path forward um, to get a possible path forward to get to the stars in less than, uh, say, 40 years. Uh, but it's not an easy path forward. But the consequences of doing that are really quite profound. Um, so we'll go through some of this. This last statement is, is really true if you look at it. You know, the consequences of mastering this technology are truly transformative in the real sense of the world, word. So for those of you that don't deal with propulsion on a day-to-day -day basis, there's a unit that we call specific impulse which is um, sometimes called, denoted I with a little SP. Um, it's, if you had a weight of propellant on the Earth, the uh, specific impulse is the number of seconds the fuel would be able to keep itself off the ground, i.e. accelerate against the Earth's gravity at the surface of the Earth. So the thrust is related to the specific impulse by multiplying by G at the surface of the Earth and the mass flow uh, coming out. So uh, the ISP is given in seconds. Uh, for something like the solid rocket boosters on the shuttle, it was around 250. Uh, the hydrogen oxygen engines are about 450. An ion engine is around 3,000. And a photon thruster is around 30 million. So higher ISP in general is considered to be good, but there are issues that we'll have to speak about as to when one is appropriate uh, and not the other. So the ISP of a photon thruster is about 100,000 times that of a conventional uh, chemical thruster and about 10,000 times that of an ion engine. And the way that we're doing it, we carry no propellant, which means the mass of the spacecraft is dramatically reduced. If you have a mass-limited situation, photons are best. If you have a power-limited situation, photons are the worst. So you have to choose your propellant correctly. A couple numbers to keep in mind. Um, when the shuttle or the Dragon or the Proton uh, take off, uh, they have about 50 gigawatts of equivalent power going off the launch pad. The kinetic energy of something like the shuttle in low Earth orbit is about a kiloton equivalent in terms of TNT. Uh, and the time it takes to get from the ground to low Earth orbit is a order of five to 10 minutes. So not very long. On the other hand, if you wanted to take a, uh, a wafer and bringing up to 20% the speed of light uh, in the system I'll show you, it takes also a few minutes. Um, by the time 10 minutes is over, you're already at 20% the speed of light. And the kinetic energy of that wafer is a kiloton, approximately. So the, they're about the same. 10 minutes, 10 minutes, kiloton, kiloton, and it also turns out the power is the same. Yes? Is that from lower orbit? That's from low Earth orbit going out. Yeah, you can't, I don't know how to efficiently blast it off from the surface of the Earth. That requires a different kind of, there's a way forward for that, but it's not something we're focused on. Uh, you can use an ablation, laser-driven ablation engine, but that's not what we're doing. So why can you talk about this now and, and not just be another science fiction discussion? And really it comes down to a consumer uh, and telecommunications industry, the same thing that many of you are, are a part of. Um, we can now efficiently convert light into electricity. <coughs> we have photovoltaics that are approximately 50% efficient now for uh, more exotic cells. And we can efficiently convert electricity and light. We have LED lighting now that's about 50% efficient as well. And uh, you know the current state of the art of both is about 50%. So that's not going to go up by orders of magnitude. Right? We're already there. You know, we'll slowly climb up you know, 60, 70, 80% efficiency and work our way up. But that's going to be a, a long and slow slog. Uh, a laser pointer you know, is a good example of a, of a, of a semiconductor laser. 
Uh, but there are ways to get incredibly high power levels that we'll talk about um, and that can be phase locked. And that's the key to this, this system. Uh, coherence is the key. It allows you to make synthetic aperture radar systems except synthetic aperture laser systems. Uh, and that's really the key. So this little box here, which you can't see the size of, but it's a, about the size of a book. Uh, that's three kilowatts in a single mode fiber and about 40% efficient today. Won't be long before it's, uh, it weighs about, has a mass about five kilograms. It'll soon be less than one kilogram. So our baseline for this program is a ytterbium fiber amplifier, much like the erbium, which is different from ytterbium. The erbium fiber amplifiers that are used in communication systems uh, and fiber optics are similar but much lower power. These are ytterbium. Uh, the ytterbium dope fibers and they're incredibly efficient. They have about an 85 plus percent optical pumping efficiency. You pump them at 976, they laser 1064. And the ratio of those two turns out to really be the actual efficiency, not just the theoretical efficiency. Uh, the wall plug efficiency is limited by the 976 uh, uh, pump, nanometer pump laser, which is currently about 55% uh, which is in gas on gallium arsenide. And that's moved, been moving up uh, slowly as well. But again, we're within a factor of two of unity, so that's not going to change dramatically. The total wall plug efficiency of the amplifiers is the product of the pump efficiency and the optical efficiency, and that's 42% today. And that's where we are. Probably within a couple of years, we'll be above 50%. Uh, there, are, uh, there are semiconductor uh, pump diodes that are well above 70%. So we're going to climb up, but again, we're already within a factor of a few of unity. Uh, these are all solid state. They last for years, and uh, no reason they couldn't last for years in this application. Uh, the power mass density is around a kilogram per kilowatt. Um, they're limited in uh, power in the fiber by what's called stimulated Brion scattering. Um, which is called SBS, and we'll talk about the implications of that. That's just a technical limit at the moment and can be overcome. Uh, narrow band lower power amplifiers have coherence lengths of around 100 kilometers, so much more than we need uh, in the 100 up to 200 watts now. The wide band amplifiers, uh, sorry, the high power wide band amplifiers um, are artificially broadened in bandwidth to overcome this SBS limit. Uh, and they typically have coherence lengths of a few centimeters, which is still sufficient, but there's no reason we can't get to this number um, if we work hard at it. These have been on a, a, a exponential rise. So this is power versus year um, over the last 25 years, and it has a doubling time about 20 months. So very much like the semiconductor industry with a similar exponential time scale. There's also an exponential uh, cost uh, decrease scale. So this is the, the red is the ytterbium fiber amplifiers for the last 15 years, and the blue, which needs more data points, but uh, it's approximately valid, um, is the cost of, of fiber coupled diode lasers, which is different than the amplifiers. This is the critical one. This is uh, dropping with a half time, if you will, cost to half of 18 months also. Remarkably similar to the semiconductor industry. So there's a photonics, uh, Moore's law equivalent in this uh, area, and it's uh, working to our advantage. We'll jump by that. So what makes this possible is the large scale um, uh, system design using a, a phased array. In this case, it's called a MOPA system. It's a master oscillator and a power amplifier design. So you really only have one laser, even though sometimes we call these lasers, they're really not, they're amplifiers. We split, we phase shift, we amplify, and then we couple in free space and then beam combine in free space. There's seats up here if you guys want to sit, so don't, don't be shy. Uh, and then you have to um, adjust the system to steer the beam. So these are real. Uh, they exist currently. They're primarily used in directed energy systems for a variety of applications that I think you can imagine. Uh, and they're becoming increasingly important in certain sectors of society. You can read that as you will, but they're very real. 
Uh, if you're inside the atmosphere, you also have to deal with the atmospheric perturbations. Um, because every element is phase shifted, you have an inherent adaptive optics system. So in astronomy, we use adaptive optics to uh, correct for atmospheric perturbations when we look at uh, stars and distant galaxies. Uh, you do the same thing in directed energy systems going through the atmosphere when you want to put uh, energy onto a target. You just have to adjust each of these to maintain the smallest spot and the highest flux on the target. So this can work inside the atmosphere. It's much easier in space, which is our baseline, but for the Breakthrough Foundation work, we're going to be inside the atmosphere to keep the cost down. In theory, we can do that, and we'll certainly work hard uh, to show that we can. Um, it's fairly encouraging that 10-meter class telescopes already achieve um, high strail ratios or, or good you know, uh, spot efficiency, if you will. The upcoming 30-meter class telescopes are working hard to push to the same level, and I'm quite confident they will. So we're currently targeting a kilometer class array, which is enormous by standards currently done in the laboratory over the next three decades, so it's not today. Uh, today these things are sort of desktop level, but all the numbers when you look at them uh, show that you should be able to do this on large scales. The coherence numbers, the phase noise numbers, they all look like you can do this. And this is not just my opinion, but the opinion of many in the field. There doesn't seem to be a fundamental reason why we cannot do this. It's just going to be complicated. Okay. So here's small, uh, here's examples of small systems. Each one of these is about uh, roughly three, four centimeters in diameter just for scale. So these are, you know, about a yay big. Uh, and each of them is several kilowatts. So uh, the largest one is a 21 element array here. This is roughly 20 to 60 kilowatts, depending on the amplifiers you put in there. So that packs a, a fair punch in it, and you can focus a spot onto something small, and I'll let you imagine what you might do with such a thing. If you scale up uh, and have a, a much larger array, in this case, a uh, thousand by a thousand array, which you know sounds uh, extremely aggressive by today's standards, but we're solely working towards that. Uh, you get just what you expect, at least on paper, namely if you introduce random phase errors into each element with, a, in this case, a lambda over 20 random phase error, you get just what you might imagine. It's just like in classical optics. You have to keep the errors down to less than about lambda over 10 to get good strail ratios. So this is a synthetic aperture um, optical system. Okay, when I talk to this... When I talk about this most people, I really try to point out um, uh, trends of the past as an indicator of the future. So this is a, a nice example of the historical cost of computer memory, which has changed 11 orders of magnitude decreased uh, in 60 years. So that's a lot. 10 to the 11 power, 100 billion times lower cost in 60 years. You know, that's an enormous change. The cost of computation has decreased by 17 orders of magnitude in the last hundred-ish years. So these are phenomenal changes. You know, the, the cost of, of other things, or in this case, in case photovoltaics, um, has decreased by about a factor of a thousand in the last 40 years. And it's now tapering off so that when you put uh, photovoltaics on your house, it's no longer dominated by the cost of the module. It's now dominated by the cost of the installer. And that, we've already hit that level um, several years ago. But th this was an extrapolation. I pulled out an old extrapolation done in 2008, just to show you an example. Um, there was a bit of a silicon uh, uh, shortage in 2008. Uh, well, actually, it was a little before 2008. And there was a projection ahead. And this is the projection from the year 2008. They projected by the year 2025, we'd be at a um, dollar per watt. And this is the module cost, not including installation. Well, the year is 2016. And the module costs are well below a dollar a watt. Um, we're significantly ahead of schedule. And the module costs, if they dropped to zero, would still have an installed cost of about a, a dollar to t one to two dollars. So we've already hit the limit. But some things don't scale well. And in fact, the cost from Earth to low Earth orbit um, does not scale well with time. Now, this is not versus time. This is versus tons delivered. 
But when you look at it over time, it hasn't changed very much in the last uh, 50 years. It's changed some, but not dramatically so. So this is a critical area for the future. It does not affect uh, the ground-based approach for the system, but it does affect a future space-based approach. And I'll explain the difference later. Well, you're familiar with directed energy from everything from this laser pointer um, to chips in your DVD to um, uh, this is the uh, National Ignition, Ignition Facility laser or the predecessor of it at Lawrence Livermore. And then we have directed energy systems for um, programmatic applications which are coming online extremely rapidly now. I'll go by that. Uh, this will be important for uh, powering uh, our system in the future is that we'd like to have thin film photovoltaics. So this is an area that UCSB uh, has some expertise in. And I just was looking at a company called Alta Devices up in the Bay Area, and they have a very nice thin film gallium arsenide process for laying down um, high efficiency, uh, over 30% efficient photovoltaics. Now, the photovoltaics are not useful for the cruise phase, but they are useful when you get to the star uh, to add power to the system. The system is actually powered by a radioisotope generator during the cruise phase. Um, but that's relevant for later. The same kind of systems are useful for planetary defense. And there's a, more than a dozen papers on our website if you want to uh, read about that. Uh, basic, the, the basic answer is you can protect the Earth against any uh, known threat up to many, many hundreds of meter class asteroids. So that's useful for uh, those that worry about the Earth being devastated by an, an asteroid impact. And because it's a standoff system, you can hit a target at the speed of light rather than getting a, a spacecraft to it. In this case, this is a design we proposed to NASA for a, a very small uh, payload carrying about a, a 50 kilowatt directed energy system, which is small. Um, and even that can deflect a fairly large asteroid if you have time. If you don't have time, then you want to hit it uh, from near the Earth, which is what we will now have the ability to do if we build this system. Uh, there's a lot of papers that talk about this. It, it works really well. I don't want to dwell on that. So there's a lot of other interesting uh, uses for this directed energy uh, system, which this part stands for a system for targeting asteroids and exploration, which the R is what we're talking about today. It's not just for planetary defense. Um, you can vaporize space debris uh, rather easily uh, with a tiny version of this system that I'm going to talk about. You can use it for detection and orbit determination for uh, incoming targets. You could do composition analysis for mining. Uh, you can drive a spacecraft, which is what I'm going to focus on. You can beam power to distant spacecraft. Um, and you can even send power down the ground and uh, see our website for lots of movies. Uh, last year, we, we got a NASA grant to explore this further. Um, the program is called DEEP. It's directed energy for, um, for basically uh, going interstellar in terms of propulsion. We had a phase one study, which was completed uh, two months ago. And basically, we looked at could we propel uh, spacecraft on a wafer to relativistic speeds. So I want to give you some of the details of that. If you look within 25 light years of the Earth, you find a number of targets to hit. Um, this is a, a map in light years in both directions. Um, the galactic center is that away for those of interest. Uh, and many of them have planets already. Many of, them, many of the stars are known to have planets. Uh, Alpha Centauri is not, it's not clear yet that it has planets. Uh, if it doesn't have planets, we would still go there anyway just to, to see. But if it doesn't, we would go to some of the many other stars that are available. And of course, the consequences of going relativistic have to be understood in the time scale of evolution of technology. We're on a, a year and a half exponential rise in technology. In the time it takes to get a spacecraft to um, Alpha Centauri, which is in the most optimistic case about 20 years, we will have a number of doublings, which is about 13. Well, two to the 13th power is a, a large number. Right? It's 8192. 
Um, so you have already gone through many, many doublings of technology by the time you get there, which means you, by the time you get there, you can build a much larger system uh, if you want to. Uh, this sort of makes it very clear as to the problem that we have. This is speed on this axis in meters per second, in fractions of the speed of light, and in gamma minus one, where gamma is the relativistic uh, gamma factor. Uh, we get literally within one meter per second of the speed of light uh, for very low mass, i.e. elementary particles like protons and electrons. Um, but when we go to the human scale, and this is in mass and kilograms, and you're somewhere over here, um, we have a very hard time getting to speeds which are more than you know, sort of 10 kilometers per second. So there's a divide between that which we can do on the, on the elementary particle level, on the truly microscopic level, and on the macroscopic level. And this is the realm that we believe directed energy uh, will play a role in, and that which NASA has funded us to look at, and that which the directed, uh, the group from the Breakthrough Foundation has just uh, pledged hundred million dollars towards. So it's relatively simple conceptually. You, you take uh, a laser uh, and you point it at something and the momentum of the light is transferred to that which you're pointed at. So you don't feel it but this is being pushed back and the screen is being pushed forward. It's about, oh, about seven nanonewtons per watt. So it's relatively tiny. But if you have high power systems and a, a low mass craft, you can get to relativistic speeds. And while it seems um, you know, very futuristic, it looks like it's within our realm to do so. So this is just artist conception. If you want to look at the physics of flight, uh, just take a look at our website. The critical issue is that the scaling of speed, which is uh, V naught here is the speed to when the beam diverges to the size of the spacecraft sail. It goes like the square root of the power, the square root of the size of the array, the square root of the diameter of the, of the uh, spacecraft, and goes like the inverse square root of the total mass of the system. However, if you notice that, sorry, you notice that there are two terms here. This is the size of the spacecraft, and this is the Sorry, the, the size of the sail on the spacecraft, this is the mass of the spacecraft. When you put those together and ask what the optimum is, just um, look at the optimum solution, it turns out the speed is maximum when the um, size of the, when the mass of the sail equals the mass of the spacecraft. When you do that, you find the scaling with mass is mass to minus one quarter power. That's important because the, as you increase the mass of the spacecraft by a factor of 10,000, so they go from a gram to 10,000 grams or 10 kilograms to uh, 100,000 kilograms, uh, the speed only changes by a factor of 10 each time. So it's much less dramatic change in speed than you might imagine. And the reason is, as you increase the spacecraft mass, you increase the size of the reflector. Uh, and it's that optimization which yields this, which most of the people, when they first think about this, uh, miss that point. So that's very important for uh, scaling into the future. Uh, don't worry about the rest of this, but if you want to look at the details in the paper. So the system that the Breakthrough Foundation wants us to look at is the one that we, the largest one we proposed in our paper, which is 100 gigawatts, which is you know, phenomenal by comparison. So just to be clear, the largest directed energy systems today are pushing a megawatt. So this is 100,000 times the largest directed energy systems we have today. Now, you might say that's a lot, and indeed it is. But if you go back 30, 40 years, the largest directed energy systems we had, at least with semiconductor uh, systems, was vastly smaller. And therefore, one could imagine going ahead in the future, not because I want to produce a single 100 gigawatt laser. That's not what we're interested in doing. We're interested in arraying uh, millions of very modest, currently existing lasers at the kilowatt level into an array. We actually don't need the subsystems to be more powerful than they are today. One kilowatt lasers in single mode fibers is sufficient. We just now need to parallel them. We don't need more efficiency. 
We don't really even need more coherence length. We just need to parallel them um, and prove that we can do it, of course. So this sounds like an enormous number, but think about it. It's just like parallel processing and computing. If someone asked you to build a petaflop computer in 1965, which is 50 years ago, you would have said that's not possible. But today, a petaflop computer is 1,000 gaming cards, each of which is $100. And therefore, uh, that's the kind of Moore's law that we're on today. Uh, you can build much smaller systems, and you'll get much smaller speeds uh, for a given mass. Uh, there are relativistic effects. They're relatively minor. Um, at 30% the speed of light, for example, they're only about a 5% effect. So it's not going to be as dramatic as in the movies where you punch the, uh, the warp drive. Um, however, the energies are still significant. Uh, a one gram wafer going at 30% the speed of light is over a kiloton, which is the energy of a small tactical nuclear weapon. And a kilogram, which is like a small CubeSat, is a megaton. So those are formidable uh, numbers, and you might be careful as to what you hit. Um, or someone may come back and not be happy with you. Um, well, f there's nothing magical about photon uh, you know, transferring the momentum and light to things, and done in the laboratory all the time. Here's a literally a 1,000 sigma measurement that this undergraduates did in our lab just to uh, play around. And it's, it's really quite trivial to do as long as you build your torsion balance properly. You can also uh, photon recycle. And you can bounce photons back and forth in a cavity. Uh, so for example, John's group, I think, has achieved Qs of what, 10 million or, or more? More, 100 million. 100 million, OK. Um, so the finesse equivalent to that is similar to the Q, I guess. It's comparable. I mean, you're, you're effectively bouncing photons back and forth, although you think about it a little bit differently. But um, you know, if, if you imagine I have a mirror here and a mirror down below, and I just bounce photons back and forth, I can uh, have an arbitrarily large force on a mirror above, just by bouncing photons um, an arbitrarily large amount of time, the time uh, between them. So we do this in laboratory all the time. If you look at the LIGO experiment, they uh, photon recycle with a factor of about 5,000. That's their uh, amplification game just by passive uh, means. So it works great in the laboratory. Uh, there are finesses today, you know, well in excess of 100,000. John's group is well in excess of many millions. But I don't know how to do this on the scales that are required. I, I just don't know how to do it, and so we don't assume any photon recycling. We assume zero. Um, but that's an interesting area to look at in the future. And some people have done it in laboratory at short scales. At large scales, I just don't know how to do it. So we don't assume that. Uh, in the laboratory, if you take a mirror and throw it in, we did it, you get about a factor of 10 you know, right off the bat. Um, but over long scales are needed, I just don't know how to do it. Uh, if you apply the kind of powers we're talking about, for relatively small payloads, they're just shot ballistically out of the system. You don't have to kick them around and around the Earth. They're shot out at thousands of Gs, literally tens of thousands of Gs. So the Earth's gravity is essentially irrelevant. This is a plot of X and Y relative to the, um, the Earth's orbit around the sun, and they're just shot out immediately. The laser's on for a few minutes, and then it's gone, and then you can shoot the next one if you have enough power. There's uh, a long discussion in the paper about how do you power a spacecraft for 20 to you know, 100 years when you don't have any solar uh, power around of any significance. So the, the preferred way of doing that is using a radio thermal generator, namely a little bit of uh, radioactive compound. The one of choice is plutonium-238, which is not the weapons type, it's not 239, which is the fissile type. Um, it has about a 90-year half-life. Uh, currently, they, it produces about 400 milliwatts of thermal power, because it's just a thermal generator, which produces about 30 milliwatts uh, at a 7% conversion efficiency. For example, uh, John's group, among others, have looked at uh, silicon nanowire converters and other converters that 
or like uh, thermoelectric inverters, but on a, on a, a scale that's appropriate for us. Uh, MEMS generators or mechanical generators could give you up to 30% efficiency, uh, something like a Stirling engine efficiency, although these have never been built, at least to my knowledge. But that would be an interesting um, option to ponder because RTGs are used on many NASA missions, including uh, the Curiosity on Mars and uh, the New Horizons mission. We don't have another way to power uh, spacecraft in deep space. So if you just run the numbers, the, the wafer using a, a third of a gram, 300 milligrams of plutonium, would run at between 100 and 300 Kelvin just from the heat of the uh, plutonium. Uh, you could also put on board a, a narrow band gap photoconverter and actually power the spacecraft um, uh, with the same laser that you shot it out with out to about a light year. Um, but that I don't think is a great option. Uh, I think a better option is to use photovoltaics when you get to the star and then you have potentially a huge amount of power by comparison to the um, RTG. Okay. Um, so we think it, just plain silicon will work here and if need be silicon germanium is a possibility. And gallium arsenide is an option but I don't think you need to go there. Well, there's all kinds of communications backgrounds so if you want to run a uh, a link margin calculation, which we do in our paper. You have a laser, uh, laser on board to communicate back to the Earth. Uh, it takes about a watt uh, to get back data at uh, sort of 100 bit per second level. You have to consider the zodiacal background, which is the background of light uh, from scattering off the dust in the Earth's um, orbit around the Sun. At a micron, that's relatively small in terms of number of photons per square meter per second, per square second. You can see at a micron, if you're looking perpendicular to the plane, it's less than 10 photons per square meter per second, per square second. You can use the same array as a phased array telescope, which uh, allows you to re receive the photons back. So this offers the possibility of going to kilometer class telescopes, which is something that we don't know how to do with ordinary uh, telescope applications. So this might be a, a phenomenal application in the future for astronomy, um, and it's the baseline for the system. Uh, there's been work done at UCSB and, and John's group and among others of producing phased arrays on wafers, although I think this would be hard for us for right now, so we're currently looking at a single laser emitter instead of a phased array. Uh, we run through all the things we can think of. Here's dust hits. If you're worried about dust hitting your system, you get uh, awarded several hundred dust hits on the way out. Um, if you go edge on, you get proton hits. Uh, each proton that you run into, or each hydrogen uh, gas, each hydrogen atom you run into looks like a 19 MeV proton just because of the relativistic speeds, but you hit them hedge, edge on. Uh, don't worry about that. Okay, so the hardest case is this uh, wafer scale spacecraft, and the one that NASA asked us to look at, and the one that the, the uh, foundation is, is looking at now. Uh, in that case, if you look at all these parameters, which I'm not going to bore you with, but you might want to look at this one, which is the photon rate at the Earth, um, which you can see here. Um, if you go all the way out in terms of <clears throat> time and years, here's 10 years, so this is when you get there you get of order you know, thousands of photons per second, um, which sounds like not very much, but in fact, that's sufficient for a uh, data link. Well, there's a comparison of what if you had antimatter? Um, how would this compare? So we compare to what we call a perfect antimatter or annihilation engine. <clears throat> so here we assume complete conversion of mass into energy, uh, zero confinement mass, uh, zero reaction chamber mass, zero exhaust divergence angle, and that you know, antimatter is free, none of which are true, of course. Um, and how does it compare to directed energy? And the answer is <coughs> directed energy is a factor two more efficient for the same amount of power and thrust. Uh, and the reasoning is trivial. <coughs> so for reference, a kilogram of antimatter is a, equivalent to about 50 megatons, which is roughly the largest uh, thermonuclear weapon ever detonated. And a gram of antimatter is about 50 kilotons. So it would be great to have antimatter uh, in the right hands. It would be bad to have antimatter in the wrong hands. Um, that doesn't exist. But even if you had it, 
you'd still be more efficient uh, in using a directed energy system because you don't carry any mass with you. In antimatter-based systems, you have to carry the mass. Um, has anyone ever beamformed at some nanoradian scales? And the answer is yes. Um, while not at a micron, there's a telescope, uh, which is actually an array, a phased array of telescopes, um, not a dense array like we're talking about, but a very sparse array operating at, in the far infrared at one millimeter <coughs> with a base lane all the way across the Earth. And they've achieved uh, a tenth of a nanoradian, which is about the same scale. We're only going to a nanoradian in the Breakthrough Prize uh, fa Foundation funding. And they're going after imaging the black hole at the center of the galaxy. So, you know, this could be hard, but there's some precedent. They go up through the atmosphere in this case. We won't worry about that. <coughs> uh, just to give you a quick example, <coughs> if you look at the Kepler exoplanets, which are the exoplanets discovered by the Kepler mission, which are about 1,000 light year away, um, that's a sweet spot for them. Um, if you had the same system we're talking about, you would look like the brightest star in the sky. Uh, from If we shined at them or they shined at us, it would look like the brightest star in the sky, which has rather profound implications for SETI. I won't deal with that. Um, some people worry about this being used as a weapon, uh, which is not a bad thing to ponder. But if you look at it, you can block it if you're in space, or you can look at the other way is can you transmit up through the atmosphere? So this is transmission as a function of wavelength. Here's one micron. There turns out to be a very nice window there you can get more than 95% of the light through the atmosphere. <clears throat> so if we're at a high altitude site, such as we're baselining uh, in Chile, you can get uh, about 95% through at 1.06 microns, which is where we're at. So this is not like the Apollo mission. I'm just going to show you a series of charts really quickly, um, where you go to the moon, and, you, and 50 years later, you haven't gone back. And this is not what we're interested in, do, in doing. One directed energy driver radically transforms the whole landscape. Uh, you can send anything out from subgram to you know megagram levels if you want. Uh, it's just larger mass is slower. So in theory, you could get the same day uh, to Mars. Um, I'm not suggesting that you would, although we have had some discussions with people that work at interesting companies. Um, I don't think it makes sense myself. One could imagine if you wanted to send cargo back and forth to Mars, you know, 100 years from now, uh, if you built two of these systems, one here and one on Mars, you could ping pong and get to Mars in less than a month. So there's some discussion about uh, doing that. I'm not particularly uh, working on that. And then uh, planetary defense and asteroid mining, there's lots of things you can do. You can also do terraforming, which is uh, terrifying to many people, but actually, I think, is worth looking at. Uh, I'm going to show you a series of charts of spending profiles. This is the total federal outlays um, versus the Apollo program. Okay, So the Apollo program was a tiny blip on the total outlays. If you look at the total cost in 2008 dollars, here's Apollo, here's the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, um, here's the federal debt, interest, etc. You know, the Apollo program is still relatively small. Um, NASA budget currently is about less than 1% of the U.S. budget, about half percent. In the Apollo era peak, it was about 4.5%. Okay, so the Apollo program cost about $200 billion uh, in 2015 equivalents. At the time, it was $22 billion. If you're going to go to interstellar capability, it's not going to be a cheap program. Um, and it really requires a very long-term, dedicated will to do so, and both a national and ultimately an international effort. And this has uh, implications for how we would uh, run such a program. In order to do this, we'd really have to lower access if we had a space-based system. And we're not currently looking at that, but if we did, we'd have to lower access by much more than a factor of 10, which is possible. Uh, we'd have to reduce the cost of PV by a factor of 100. And keep in mind, space PV is currently a factor of 1,000, more expensive than terrestrial PV, mostly because of uh, uh, just uh, the, the demand for space is very low. And we have to reduce the cost of lasers by more than a factor of 10. It's 
currently between $10 and $50 a watt for the amplifiers. And we'd have to learn how to build large space, space structures, which is why we're not focusing on that. Okay, so sometimes people talk about sending humans uh, to space, and I would say humans are largely useless, right? So if you look at yourself, or me, 99% of us is useless mass, right? Look at yourself. <laughs> You're just useless, right? You're high maintenance, right? It takes more than a kilogram per day just to keep you alive. What's useful, right? You're just useless. Of course, people tell us all the time about academics. You don't have a sleep mode or a hibernate mode, right? You can't. There's no control alt delete. Um, so I know people don't like to hear this, but I think we have to be modified somehow if we're ever going to go interstellar. Uh, just, just about the end here. Uh, this has radical implications for searching for intelligence. Um, it turns out if we build a system we're talking about for uh, propulsion, we could see all the way across the universe or be seen all the way across the universe. So if there's any other technology, technologically advanced civilizations, we should be able to see them today if they transmit like we transmit, we could transmit. So this is a, a paper I wrote recently on the archives as about two weeks ago, which looks at the probability detection as a function of the uh, distance away. And the bottom line is that uh, you could see with unity probability across our entire galaxy, which means um, basically 100 billion planets in our galaxy. If there was one planet transmitting randomly, and we looked with a small one meter class telescope on the Earth for 30 years, we would have unity probability of detection, i.e. we would see them. And they would just have to transmit randomly. They don't have to transmit towards us, just randomly. Uh, and that's a, like, to me, that was a really interesting implication. You might want to take a look at that. Okay, there's a lot of policy issues, um, and I'll talk about that maybe in the question and answer period. And you can hide your head in the sand and say this is not something to worry about, but it is. There's a lot of policy issues in terms of building something this large. Uh, it's basically a million times larger than the current tactical energy weapon systems. So if that doesn't, you don't think there's a policy problem? Great, okay. Uh, there's some issues there. Uh, but uh, surprisingly, the DOD has not been ad an adversary in this. They see this not because they see it as what you might think they see it as. That doesn't threaten them because they're not, this is not a tactical system. This is a huge system which is easily, um, you know, stopped. Uh, so how do you prevent a directed energy arms race? You don't because you cannot. It's too late. Um, you cannot stop this. Uh, it's, it's gone. Uh, you really want to have some sort of international oversight of the program that we're talking about. So the people involved in this have already been to NASA, to ESA, to Congress, to the White House, and they've already uh, had discussions with them. So what could UCS roles be, UCSB's role be? Well, we've led the overall effort. The only reason they funded it is because of the work that UCSB did. Um, Yuri Milner, who's the person putting up $100 million, you know, says UCSB is the reason why they're putting up $100 million, because you know, we showed the way forward. But you guys have an amazing um, infrastructure here for photonics, materials, and semiconductors. So you know, now is the time to think about it. Uh, producing everything from low temperature electronics, with imagers, spectrometers, et cetera, sticking them onto a wafer, um, RTGs and thin film photovoltaics. We don't do RTGs here, but we could certainly, um, John's and other groups have done uh, RTG converters, uh, thermal converters. Uh, how do you store energy on board? Because we want to store the energy, trickle charge, and then burst a laser comm out. How do you build a battery or a supercapacitor that works for, you know, 100 years? You're not powering it for 100 years on a chemical battery, but you have to be able to store and then burst and have that thing live uh, long enough uh, that it just doesn't die on the way. Again, it's not the power source, it's storing energy. Uh, Wafer-based laser communications, that I believe is doable, looks doable. Um, I'm not, uh, not a great fan of this quite yet because it's complicated, but um, it has been done here. And then how do you build a sail that can handle these kinds of forces that's uh, low mass enough? I don't actually know how to do that. 
luckily the scaling with mass is not extreme, so um, we can start with higher mass sales. And then there's, uh, I think this is a big one. In the future, we might have direct semiconductor amplification instead of using euterbium fiber uh, power amplifiers. So if you're interested, um, please see us. Uh, we're in the mode where we're being asked to propose um, what to do. And so this is the conclusions, right? This is not science fiction any longer. It's going to be hard and will outlive me, um, and, but it doesn't have to outlive uh, some of you. So this is no longer science fiction. It's actually moving into the realm of science. And we have not found a reason why you cannot do this, which is what I spent years um, in talking to people, why can't we do this? There's no reason that we've found. If you find one, please let me know. Uh, there's a nice roadmap uh, that you can look at to relativistic flight. It's going to need lots of tweaks. Uh, it's scalable modular. You can, they're all identical subsystems. So you can uh, mass produce them. You're not building one gigantic laser, you're building an array of small lasers, which allows for a huge economy of scale. So uh, Yuri said to me, you know, how are we going to produce these lasers? And I said, well, there's a couple companies that make them. And he said, fine, I'll buy the company. Um, OK. Uh, which actually makes sense, of course. You know, if you, you're serious about this, you just buy the company that makes them and drive the cost down. Um, they're all made by hand today. So the costs are, if you look inside the box, you say, there's nothing in the box. I mean, so there's, there's just some fibers, a little bit of ytterbium, um, and some semiconductors that drive it. That's it. There's nothing in there. It's just they build them one by one by hand. OK, um, it's hard. Yes, is it impossible? Does not appear to be. Um, it's definitely not for the faint of heart. So if you're looking for a fast thesis, this is not your solution. Okay. So, um, so how do you fund this? Well, we just got $100 million um, pledged towards us. Um, how do you fund the real program, which is going to be tens of billions to hundreds of billions of dollars? Um, this was a subject of a lot of interesting conversations with people that are, you know, orders of magnitude above my pay grade. And 100 million, to me, is an impossible number, but was a rather um, not so impossible number to some people. And the time scale was incredibly compressed. Imagine submitting a proposal and then 12 weeks later being told yes, and here's $100 million without even writing a proposal. Just imagine what it's not something I deal with. Um, so how do you raise a few billion dollars? They tell me, yes, you can do that. How do you raise a trillion dollars? No. OK. They said, no, we're not doing that. So uh, I'll stop there. And if there's any questions, maybe we could talk about this and the implications for doing this and how does UCSB participate? So, okay.